unless you choose to later, is the song is very, it's called Detente, Wait. And you are debating whether you should install common dispensers and dorms in residence halls. That, the research that was done by USAID indicated the need to install condom dispensers very freely in Latin America. But the research also indicated that the Catholic Church would not hear it and any music videos or commercials that were made promoting condoms would not survive. And therefore, what was decided was to have a music video series that would basically tell teenagers not to have sex, wait until you get married. And the figures are appalling. Perhaps the music video the music video reached the hit of the uh, the head of the pop charts and was on the pop ch top of the charts for many many weeks. So it was extremely catchy, entertaining. But once you watch it, you would say, "But so what? So are teenagers going to not have sex as a result of this music video?" And Tatiana confesses, "I met her two weeks ago in Los Angeles and." She was saying that the figures are not great about how this has had any impact, but if it made somebody think, that's important. So that was a constraint on the content of the programming in that area. Okay, uh, I, will, I can give you more illustrations of how the context impacts on how communication systems are programmed, the hardware that's donated, pro, uh, the beneficiaries of the programming. You know, contextual influences include NASA that did the research to develop the applications technology satellites that led to the direct broadcast satellites that are used here. The Brazilian Space Agency that chose to use the satellites strictly for military applications and telephony, even though all the rhetoric was education. There are socio-cultural forces include, say, the Foreign American Motion Picture Export Association. It's a very strong lobby that exports American movies all over. Foreign contextual forces include U.S. universities that go into third world countries to design communication systems. They include the Ford Foundation. They include churches 
that run radio and TV stations. They include Hughes Aircraft that produces satellites. They include people who sell computer systems and data communication systems. So you've got a range of forces. And now that we look at it, you say, yeah, it's true that we were naive about how commun what communication can do in the third world. We didn't look at all these actors and what influences they had. And that is the point I would leave, like to leave with you, that many of you are looking at education and communication in the third world very idealistically with great good intentions. And just bear in mind that everything that you do is conditioned by who owns and operates the country, who are the forces, the economic, political, and cultural forces, the scientific and technological forces, historically, over the colonial period, <coughs> geographically, and in the present day. I will stop now and be happy to take questions. Yes, please. I'd be interested in, uh, in uh, knowing if you could cite one or two specific cases of where you think the introduction of new technology has been done so successfully yeah. and why. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Perhaps, mm -hmm. lose, perhaps learning from some of these, uh, the kind of all the mistakes that have been made. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, I will tell you but what happened with many of these new technologies is that in their early phases, when they're well funded, they do very well. And when the financing from the donor, whether it's USA or UNESCO, dies, then the country is left to fend for itself. And then frequently they resort to commercial financing, which then kills the educational application it was introduced for or they use it for political domination. Now, I have, uh, I'm thinking of when radio in Nicaragua, before the revolution, and during the revolution, <coughs> before the revolution, USA was involved in Nicaragua in teaching educational program mathematics to primary school children. This is a project I'm familiar with because I was at Stanford at that time. And the Center for Mathematics Education, a philosopher mathematician called Pat Sufis, had evolved a method of teaching math in bits and pieces, basically an instructional design approach to teaching mathematics. And he decided to try it on radio. And so they got a contract from USA to go to Nicaragua to work with the Nicaraguans to redesign the educational curriculum for mathematics for the primary grades. And they taught math on radio for five years. They took the curriculum, broke it up into pieces, and transmitted radio programs. The children had worked books in the classroom the first year, and they found that to have radio and workbooks was very expensive. And so they did away with the workbooks and they used bottle caps as apparatus in the classroom, sticks, stones, because kids had nothing to come to it. And so they would tell them, go and bring so many bottle caps in tomorrow for class. And that radio program was evaluated and found extremely successful in terms of how much math students learned and how much they retained. Unfortunately, that project ended with the revolution and the withdrawal of USAID from Nicaragua. And the methodology has been found extremely successful and is being applied in other countries around the world to teach English in Kenya, English and Thai in Thailand. I have used some variation of that teach instructional design methodology in other countries I have worked in. So I would if there is something that's come out of those errors, it is a methodology in terms of designing educational programs. That's one illustration. I would also like to share with you the Indian satellite TV experience that Nina Trivedi worked on and I worked on, where we used this approach to design political consciousness raising programming. In one district in Gujarat state in India, a small rural transmitter was set up. And what we did was 
we decided that since the Constitution of India encourages you to educate people about their political rights and legal rights, and at that time the ruling party said that there was a minimum wage and people landless laborers should not accept anything except the minimum wage. And we were a TV station working for government. We thought we would have to test how far we could go with this. And so we decided to go in and do a situational analysis of landless laborers' living conditions and design television programs to raise their political awareness of how they were being exploited and that they should demand their rights and what kinds of recourses they had. Now this was a project that made us feel very good as instructional designers, as politically committed TV researchers and producers. Unfortunately, the lesson that we learned from that was that we went home to the comfort of the city and we did sort of video verite exposes of landlords not paying the minimum wage of laborers complaining. And the combination of the potency of this media was when the landlord found that his, all his laborers were going to strike at harvest time when he needed the labor most. They had decided, television told them, don't work unless you get legal minimum wage. So they all went on strike. Guess what the landlord did? He went to a neighboring village and truck loaded strike breakers who came in. And so for that harvest season, the local population got nothing. Strike breakers came in, and the houses of the villagers who struck were burnt down. So we had an illustration of how powerful the medium was, but how careful and how responsible one has to be when you use the medium. This was a local contextual force, the landlord, the political force of the landlord that we did not see. We were so obsessed with ideas and communicating these ideas through our delivery system that we did not realize <coughs> that the political environment that the villagers lived in had to be factored in and we had ignored it. I was wondering why environment wasn't one of your variables. I look at all of these as elements of the environment, you know, the economic, political, cultural, social, and if you would say the physical environment, yeah. is that what you mean? The Oh, absolutely. I think you know, the geography of the, phys uh, the physiology of the region would be extremely important because that would determine whether you use satellites at all. You know, in some parts of the world, satellites are not the right solution. But if you have large land masses, large ocean areas, satellites cover two thirds of the globe. And therefore, satellites are very useful. So, absolutely. Those were, that's why I call it illustrative contextual forces. So you can you add any other forces that you think are crucial to analyzing whether you should choose a particular communication technology in a particular situation. So yes, that's a good suggestion. Yes. Dr. Sophie, I think there are two problems really. One is the insensitivity of governments, first to languages themselves, and second to technology. I recall working with Nigeria early in the 70s with the Ford Foundation. Mm -hmm. And by about 1975, when there was going to be compulsory elementary education, they came on the radio saying, um, all mothers must get their children from 7 through 16 to school, or there will be a fine for not getting them to attend school. Now, the little villages did not have radios at that time. Perhaps 1% of the villages had radios in 1975. And secondly, the number of languages that were used by the various tribal groups and the dialect groups, they simply did not understand English. Mm -hmm. And so it was the insensitivity to how to communicate to those villages. They were, for the most part, illiterate and could not read either, so mm -hmm. there was really a, a problem in mm -hmm. terms of communicating. <coughs> Another problem which I saw was that right after the Biafran War, they did away with the telephone communication, the old call <coughs> and lines, which seem to be quite reliable, install rather modern dish tower type of transmission, which never worked until this day to try and get in a telephone call to Nigeria. Right. So neither the technology, we really nor the communication network is of such nature that we can harmonize those two and make for effective communication. Mm -hmm. Yes, quite right. Yes. The, uh, you mentioned uh, 
that the theory of Lerner or also is run uh, with a modernization concept. It was going to promote a specific model for doing for the development of the people's country. What is your point of view about the theory, the, the theory of communication now that, uh, that must also support or be another factor for, uh, or, or condition for promoting the development since your perspective, what's the state in it, or, or the status of theoretical communication for, for helping the, this development? There are a good basis now, because if we change the paradigm, the, the model of, of the modernization, what's your vision since the theory and your practice? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I subscribe, I believe in the limitations of the learner system that I was brought up with and educated with. And I confronted this only when I went back to India and started working in villages that I found this was naive. The approach that I, my contextual framework is rooted in, as you can see, will draw from political economy and from cultural studies. So if you'd like to talk later, we can talk at greater length. But basically, if you're asking, am I a Marxist? I think that's too simple. I think of the importance of political economic, economic factors, and I also see cultural variables. So I took, put, put political economy and cultural perspectives to, together. And that's the framework that I use when I analyze communication systems now. Yes? When you talked about the, the criticism of the Catholic Church, I'm curious, you know, I think looking at the context in which they were trying to do their message, you criticize perhaps that they didn't offer condoms in their message or whatever. However, in that same video done by CBS, whoever did that, mm -hmm. mentioned that condoms and the pill and all these posters yeah. plastic over weren't effective anyway. So I don't know if you if that criticism is fair because maybe they're just taking an alternative versus then you know including condoms. Right. Okay. I want to make it clear that I'm not criticizing the Catholic Church. I just use the Catholic Church as illustration of a contextual force that determined what kind of message would be presented in that video. Okay? Now, uh, also because I have researched population communication, uh, I know that uh, the condom distribution strategies in Latin America were always constrained because of that contextual reality. So that uh, they haven't been distributed terribly widely. There are lots of problems with condom distribution all over the world. I have personally been involved with evaluating projects, and there are all kinds of horror stories, like in Thailand. You have the <coughs> demonstration. The condom guy goes from house to house to demonstrate how to use condoms. And condoms are a great success, by the way, in Thailand, for various cultural reasons. And uh, what happens is that the guy demonstrates to the men in the community how to use condoms. So he puts it on the bamboo poles that the houses are built on. Nine months later, the horror story is that it comes back, everybody's got a new baby, and there are all these multicolored condoms supplied by AIB on bamboo poles outside the house. <laughs> okay? So uh, it, it's not easy. There are problems with the condom distribution strategy. But I only mentioned the Catholic Church, and I have got a lot of strength and a lot of spiritual development from the Catholic Church, so I'm the last person to criticize uh, some dimensions of it. One, one more question. Um, what are, you do offer a lot of problems, and I'm just curious for, like, for example, um, the you know, powdered milk. Uh, they offer lots of money, or they support the program. So you, what I've heard is that the education system or the educating idealism that this started on failed, basically because education couldn't be financially supported. What solution is, to, is there to that problem? I'm sorry, let me try and paraphrase what I think I understood, okay? okay? You're saying that communication systems were introduced into third world countries for educational applications, which is the point I was making, right. but that governments who were assumed to be able to support this application found they didn't have the money. And so they auctioned off the radio or TV station, like in the Ivory Coast, to advertising agencies who then run the system, okay? So you're asking me, what are the options? Right. If government does not, if, if, if in other support. words, if the government can't support it and they're being uh, railroaded by 
powder milk, you know, example, what other source may be available to uh, subsidize these programs so they get the effect that they, they initially were after? Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I really can't tell you that. I don't have any solutions. All I'm saying is that when you introduce communication systems, bear in mind the economics of the situation. There are lots of illustrations of how people do this. For example, there is discussion of having separate channels, a commercial channel and an educational channel. And so that the money that is generated from the commercial channel to the government should be siphoned off in part to run an educational channel. So that both channels exist, they are on the air all the time, and they provide options. That's one way of doing it. Another way that the idea of the Independent Broadcasting Authority in England does is that they check the text of every commercial. And seven out of ten commercials don't make it on the independent broadcasting stations in England because they make false claims. So the truth in advertising is so careful so that if, in fact, the government of Kenya checks the commercials and said, OK, in our context, this will have repercussions we can't deal with, and they have these statutes and regulations written out as clearly as in England, then you wouldn't have the kind of problem that we have. It's not that there won't be a backlash. There will be a backlash. There will be pressure. And then you come down to basics and you say, you come down to the nature of underdevelopment, the, the exploitation of third world countries, the inequality in the world system. How do they deal in sort of an uneven playing field? That's the, the fundamental issue you come down to ultimately. Yes, anyone else?